All right, fine. I'll talk for. Oh, there it goes. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? I assume that was you sending me messages on the account. There we go. Oh, I wasn't, but people might have been because I was telling them that we might do a discussion soon. Oh, that wasn't you? No, I don't think so. Oh, I that's, you know, I was like, this doesn't sound like Eddie at all. <laughs> <laughs> They're like sending me messages and talking about like setting up, you know, some sort of like TikTok live or something. And I was like, this doesn't sound like, this doesn't sound like Eddie. I don't know. But yeah, that, that, that makes sense that it wasn't, it wasn't you. Yeah, I'm just like, Carlos is doing a live stream right now, my part or website partner. So I was just promoting it on TikTok, basically. And then people asked if I do a debate. And I mentioned that I was planning on doing a discussion with you. but So you're not the one who was like asking if I was a, an anarcho-communist? Oh, no, that might be me. No, Wait, no, an anarcho-communist? No, I definitely Someone... didn't do that. Someone asked me if I was an anarcho-communist, and I was like, what? I don't... I, no, what is like, your ideology now? I'm still an ANCAP, like, from the last, like, the debate, right. the big debate. Is that what you, um, is that what you, like, because I remember when we had that debate, didn't you have, like, agorist in your bio, or? I, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't consider myself an agorist. Okay. Yeah, uh, my my position on politics definitely wouldn't be agorism. It's more some people call it like libertarian Leninism, which you know you 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 might call that idea. <laughs> yeah. So what's your what is your path to power? I have a few questions. Yeah, I think like things like grassroots campaigns and stuff like that are definitely very effective right now for libertarians. Um having people run in the Republican party rather than the libertarian party, which isn't getting anywhere works a lot better. Cause you know, you actually get Republicans to vote for you because most of them just vote Republican down the line. Anyways, you don't need, you don't even have to convince them to vote for you. So it's a, there's been like, I think it's 200, 205, 210, something around there in the past two years, or over 200 libertarian legislators in the United States have been elected, which is like completely unprecedented for libertarians in the US. So that whole strategy has worked very well. And like, what's like an immediate policy? Like, what's your top five? Like, you know, we get ANCAPs in power tomorrow. What are we doing? Top five. Um, I think foreign policy might be. I, I don't know much about foreign policy, honestly, but it seems to me foreign policy would be the most important thing to address first. Like, you know, get, getting out of other countries, getting out of wars, stuff like that. That seems like it would be very important because, you know, oftentimes you're going to have a lot of adverse effects, adverse policies that come from things like that. Um I think that would be a good thing to start with. Um, to, uh, I would want to get rid of a lot of um, federal organizations, agencies. Um, I think, let me think. What's, a, what's, what's, yeah, uh, overall, like pushing a lot more power to the states and, and especially on a local level, like decentralizing. But that's a bit that's a bit vague. There's not a lot of specifics I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I would want to loosen up like federal gun restrictions to allow citizens to be able to own firearms more. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it, things in that direction. I think there's a there's a there's a lot I could think of that would be good to do. Uh, you know, top five is kind of kind of restricts it a bit. I think. The uh, foreign policy one's interesting to me because that's like the classic point of collaboration between like socialists and libertarians. Usually, like I've seen Rand Paul and Bernie team up a lot <coughs> um, <coughs> to argue against war and intervention. Um, you know, obviously the principle of libertarianism is being against the state, and you know the military. The giant U.S. military budget is a huge use of the state, but um, 
Yeah, Max Blumenthal is like good friends with Scott Horton, who's like the big libertarian foreign policy guy. Uh, he has him on like his podcast and he writes for his website and stuff. They both like hate each other's so, politics, but they they agree on foreign policy. Right. Do you, so do you support like freeing Julian Assange then? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Because that's the other one I feel like is freedom of speech because there's so much state intervention in the in the media or even social media now. Um, it's right. wild. So, you know, there's, the there, there's definitely plenty of overlap. You know, with some leftists are very split when it comes to, like, gun control, for sure. But I know there are a lot of, like, Marxists who don't support gun control for various reasons, whether it's to arm the proletariat or because they recognize that gun control disproportionately affects poor people. And then by that nature tends to uh, disproportionately affect minority groups and then you know, yeah uh, helps cops so a lot of I uh, wish that nature sorry yeah i wish that was more of a point of agreement like there's so many marxists in the u.s who have kind of just taken the liberal position because they just think it's left you know um they just kind of put themselves in left-wing social positions by default and it's like you know all the things you said i pretty much agree with on gun control but um, but, I, mean, I don't know. Leftist. My main question, though. Oh, like, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Most leftists in America are just are just liberals, right? I mean, I think I think right. you can recognize that. Like it, when they're when they're making like takes on capitalism and and social, like they're not coming at it from like a materialist perspective or like a Marxist perspective. They're not coming at it from like Marxist economics. You know, like like Marx would recognize that capitalism creates a lot of wealth and prosperity, but Marx would say at at a certain point, there's going to be a turning point and there, there's going to be contradictions and, and stuff like that. But he would never be like, oh, yeah, capitalism never brings people out of poverty. Like like a lot of generic leftists say, you know, like Marx would be Marx, you know, understood that capitalism was like separate from feudalism and separate from like the slave system and the and the. uh, uh the the plantation economies and stuff like that but a lot of leftists they they like to mumble all that stuff together and they'll be like they'll, they'll be like oh yeah go go read capital bro and i'm like you've never read capital why are you telling me to do that bro yeah it's a lot of i mean people get mad at me sometimes when i say this but it's a lot of like moralizing like people just you know put themselves in a position based on whatever um they think is is morally correct in that moment which is often influenced by your social group or you know the people you're surrounded with especially if you're young so um yeah definitely a need for more education and materialist analysis on the left um i my main question about libertarianism i don't think this has changed since the debate like do you so you're against the government in, in the state for the most part and the repressive state apparatus but do you not see the state as like a tool of the capitalist class? Like, how are we going to get rid of the state without attacking capital in the, in the existing oligarchy? Well, we we have a very different class theory. So our class theory is the state and then the people. Now, there, there's various libertarians who have done like the class analysis and, and their, their own versions of class theory, like Roderick Long. Hans Hermann Hoppe actually did a paper um i believe it's called what marx got right and he goes over like he goes over like point by point like marx's class theory and then he says so almost all of this is correct except we need to change a few things like exploitation and, and stuff like that and he's like now we see that all of this is just pointing to the state and the people under the state so, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't even be like, oh, it's the capitalist class because I just don't see it that way. Now, like, do people use the state for their advantage? Yes, but, like, the way I see people is I see people in general as people who are pursuing profit. And I define profit, you know, of course, Marxists have their own way of defining profit. But I define profit as getting more but from your input. So everybody wants profit in some way, even though if it, it's not like, the usual thing that we think of when we hear the word, the word profit, right? Like uh, in, in like a business, you know, but everyone's profiting in some way and they're going to utilize what the tools in their belt 
in order to benefit themselves or, you know, even benefit the people around them, benefit their social groups, benefit the political groups, benefit, they might even want to benefit people as a whole. So the state's there. It's a big tool that some people can use. So people try to use it, you know? Um, Yeah. So I guess my main thing is when you, when people, because obviously that's a, a common argument that people offer about the state, even anarcho-communists or, or you know, any anarchists. Um, but, like, what do you say about, like, the UN has recognized now that, that China's poverty alleviation programs are the most incredible poverty alleviation programs in human history. And, like, you have to admit, like, the economic growth that was seen in, in the first years of the Soviet Union and China with their economic planning was incredible. Like, uh, in China, under the first 10 years of Mao, there were mistakes and, and there were famines, partially from nat- natural causes and partially from the collectivization process. And, and Mao admitted that. But, you know, now there aren't famines in China because they industrialized agriculture and it was the fastest increase in in, um, in uh, life expectancy that had ever been seen in human history. So you have all these incredible economic achievements um, going on in countries that are, are you know, facilitated by the state you know the china has the the party with 95 million members and then they have the government and their party cadres um, who report to the government what each area needs um, which keeps it sort of decentralized but also centralized because then the party creates economic plans um, and they do use you know they still have exploitation they still have markets um, they haven't abolished the commodity form or anything but they've you know abolished relative poverty in their country so like would would your I mean, would you look at that and say, you know, I, I support keeping all the good parts of China's government and getting part, getting rid of the parts of the state that I see as repressive? Or do you just want to wipe that whole state off the off the map? Well, my, my stance by definition is there are no good parts of the government. Now, there are like there are less evil parts of the government for sure. You know, like um, if if you were like tearing apart like the U.S. government, like I said, you know, you're starting off with like federal agencies and stuff like that. But you might keep in systems that are like protecting people and property, you know, like some sort of legal systems, stuff like that. You know, if you're if you're going to keep anything, you want to you want to keep in um, the things that are the less evil, the least evil. Now, in terms of like China and the Soviet Union. I know a lot more about the Soviet Union than I do China because like after debates like our debate and lots of other debates I got into with like Marxist Leninists and people who uh, talk about the Soviet Union a lot, I went to my local bookstore and then I went on Amazon and I bought like, like 15 books on the Soviet Union and then went and watched like a ton of lectures and was just reading through all these books and reading through all this data. I have like a Dropbox full of like Soviet Union data from like the CIA and the, and the, the Soviet statistics and all that stuff. So I wanted to like go through all this stuff and like look into all of these um, talking points. And what I found is most of the talking points aren't really accurate, especially with the Soviet Union. Now with China's a bit different with, with China specifically, like the poverty thing, what they're doing is they're basing that off of the absolute poverty from the world bank, which is based on, the the world in general right so you're taking every single country and you're saying now we're yeah, gonna kind of that's still thing. incredible though and the un has recognized it as the most incredible poverty alleviation like you know it's alleviated poverty by the the standards of the wealthy u.s but you know by oh shit my phone's gonna die here but yeah that's all i had to say yeah i didn't even hear what you said you, you froze so oh sorry i said i mean that, that the un is still recognized that that is the greatest like poverty alleviation program in history and like yeah they haven't alleviated poverty by the standards of the wealthy us or uk or something but you know by the like i said uh relative poverty has been abolished and that's incredible now you know the retirement age in china for for women's 55 for men at 60 and then their gdp's shooting up in, in every economic category they're progressing you know and so, I mean, you can critique the metric, I guess, but it, it's still incredible what they've done there. And, and it's been facilitated by their state, in my opinion. Yeah. The, in terms of like economic growth, per se, I, I, I don't really care about that too much because, you know, if, if a country's poor, then it's going to grow really fast. Um, you know, an example I use is, is if a man has one penny and he picks up another penny, he just doubled his wealth. But if a billionaire doubles his wealth, 
that's a lot more that's a it's a much bigger thing right so um you know if you're poor like it, that tends to happen poor countries grow really fast which you know it's it's great to see a country growing fast but that in of itself i don't worry about it too much you know like the soviet union started growing really fast it was like the 13th fastest growing economy in the entire um 20th century but you know then you have to think oh would it have been better off like in terms of welfare if they had done what japan did or if it stayed on the same route of the czarist economy you know they were in the process process of starting to liberalize things you know going in a more capitalist direction they abolished serfdom in 1861 so they were going in a, in a good direction but then there was a huge um shift the bolshevik revolution they had a famine immediately after the bolshevik revolution because of it um they went on to have the uh, holodomor famine and then get into world war ii which i think if if they had at least kept the uh new economic policy they would have done a lot better in world war ii like the soviet union got absolutely wrecked um like they, t they took so many losses because they, they their production system was just so awful. They had that, to go get like a bunch of supplies from the U.S. Every Western analyst before the war started was saying that the USSR would lose when they were going with the czarist economic policy. But because of the Soviets' mass industrialization policies and, and their process of whereas the Germans were focusing on high quality tanks and producing them at a, at a much slower rate, the Soviets were pumping out tanks um, and, and the Soviet Union massively outperformed Japan at that time. I mean, everybody was looking to the Soviet Union and wondering, you know, how they had basically performed this economic miracle and in, in bringing themselves out of poverty and industrializing um, so quickly. And, and, and the difference with China, you know, you, you said you're not that concerned with, with economic growth, but I'm not necessarily talking about... Yeah, not growth. on its own, you know. Right. I'm not necessarily talking about that. Like, uh, a good article would, um, I would recommend people check out is Michael Hudson's um, China's Industrial Socialism versus the U.S.'s Financial um, Capitalism. And it talks about the difference in our economies right now. So China has, has been investing in production. Like there's so much manufacturing and extraction industry that goes on in China. And they've been bolstering this with with countries all over the world via their Belt and Road policy versus the U.S. You know, we've seen the Rust Belt um, under, you know, in, in this era of neoliberal capitalism has outsourced a lot of these jobs. You know, we've seen a mass policy of deindustrialization. And, and now, you know, the ruling class in this country um, is a class of like bankers and, and financial capitalists, you know, real estate firms. Um, tech corporations, um, and we're act, er, and and we're producing very little. You know, we have very little actual uh, real productive wealth compared to what we used to have. Um, and and the reason China's been able to do that is is by you know using what Xi Jinping calls the uh, the visible hand of the market. So they allow the invisible hand. You know, they allow some some markets into their country. But then using the state and their system of party cadres and the 95 million member Communist Party and and these various social welfare programs and poverty alleviation efforts, they they use the visible hand to mitigate the negative effects of the market. And that's how they've seen this incredible growth. Um, and that's why they produce everything in the world. Um, so no, we've, we've, yeah. the thing, like I was saying, with like the Soviet Union. We see things where people are like just throwing a ton of resources in a direction and things are growing fast. Like the, the Soviet Union was often engaging in huge projects, huge building projects that they abandoned. And that still counted towards GDP. You know, with China, you have huge empty cities. You have them rapidly trying to build uh, high speed rail systems in the most inefficient ways they possibly can, building these these high rail systems they have to be high because you know they, they go so fast that are sinking into the ground that have to be maintained through tons of uh tons of upkeep they operate at eight to twenty percent capacity you know they just they just build things and build things without any consideration of is it needed is it actually adding value to society and that's why you need things like the price system you know like i, I wouldn't deny that they're some of the stuff they're throwing out there benefits people to a certain extent but at the same time if you're just blindly centrally planning everything and just throwing stuff out there without any sort of it's that's what the party right, cost for, though. 
there's party cadres assigned to each locality so they know exactly what what is needed i mean it's easy for the u.s media to go you know oh they're high speed they're massive high speed rail system that's just all bad high speed rail you know they produce that for no reason meanwhile in the u.s you know <clears throat> we have no high speed rail system um because the market has not taken care of that and china has this massive high speed rail system where you can go from city to city you know like like uh, that and it's it's you know they're moving towards being more uh, sustainable environmentally at the same time. Um, so you know the U.S. media looks at that and says you know oh they're sinking into the ground oh you know they're low quality or whatever or oh these these plans didn't work but you know if you look at the data they are working you know what what the cadres um, report to to the central party tends to be what the locality actually needs. Um, and, and, you know, in COVID, you could criticize China's policies for being a little bit draconian, you know. Um, but, you know, there were people in the U.S. who were really, really struggling economically uh, versus in China, the party and the government were delivering people food to their doors and necessities to their doors, you know, allowing them to stay locked down if they needed to. Like, these are things that the market just will never, ever, ever be able to take care of. Yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't have a huge surge of like DoorDash and stuff like that, you know, people like delivering food. But anyways, um, so well, I wasn't saying like high speed rails were bad, right? Like, I'm, I'm not against high speed rails. But like, Japan has high speed rails, they have one of the best train systems in the entire world, if not the best. Uh, India, India, in some places are developing high speed rails. But what they do is in, in Japan, they offer they operate these rails. Uh, with for-profit businesses, the businesses actually build other businesses on their property. Like they build hotels, um, like cafeterias, office buildings, and then they take the profits from these things, invest it into the rails, so that that actually subsidizes the rails and lets them be cheaper. Whereas in China, they cost like a day's wage to to ride. I, f I forget the exact number. They, they, they're expensive for a lot of people. A lot of, you know, people in China, they're making a lot of them are making under like six dollars an hour, um, or six dollars a day. I mean, so like a lot of people just can't afford them, and they prefer to go on the slower trains, right? And it's like, well, if we would have, if they would have handled the situation better, and you know, they still could have had their high speed rails. If we would have handled it better, come down the road, trains like the U.S. We would have it, no it would, high speed rail and crumbling infrastructure. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not defending like the U.S.'s infrastructure. We've had a lot of infrastructure. Problems, but how would state right? investment not help that? How does it help it? That's what I'm wondering. Like, it, from what I see, state infrastructure, they, they do horrible. Like, I mean, my city's infrastructure sucks and they put a lot of money into it. They just build it horrifically and they don't, they don't base it off of anything other than this is what the people in charge want to do. And that's what they do in China, China right? A lot, China, of, a lot of the time in China, they're just trying to impress people. Like, China think about, was like, semi-feudal 70 years ago. Ch the people who are living in China now in these industrialized cities, in these, these giant cities with tons of commerce and tons of economic activity and tons of production, their grandparents were peasants living under like autocratic feudal landlords. Like you can't yes. tell me that production that's, that's alleviated China. relative poverty has been for no reason. Or, and now or the landlord is state paid. investment hasn't hasn't massively helped their population, which is why ninety four percent of people, you know, support the Chinese government and the party. I mean, Americans say it's just because of propaganda, but I mean, look at our country. We have tons of propaganda, and everyone still hates the government. China supports their government because it takes care of them. Well, now, um, now the landlord is the state. Most people in China they're leasing their property from the state as the landlord, right? Like people are like, oh, look at look at the home ownership, the home ownership rate in China. But the, those people don't own their homes; they're leasing it. If we if we measured the U.S. by people, they still have homes. homes that oh, they actually the U.S. has this massive much. homeless rate. What's that? They still, you know, who cares who it belongs to? They still have homes in China. You know, the the home ownership rate. People talk about how massive it is because there's such a giant homelessness rate in the U.S. and in in capitalist countries. U.S. has a pretty low homeless rate compared to like a lot of Europe, like Germany and countries like that. Like, I mean, we, we have a high, we have about like half a million homeless people. But at the same time, we have like 20 million people with a net worth of over a million dollars, which is quite impressive. Like, I, I would like there to be no homeless people, but 
when people like focus on the uh, the negative things and say, oh, look how bad, L look at these bad things. Like, I mean, if I do that to China, then people just want to turn it back to the U.S., right? So it's just well, but in China, they have wealthy That's... people, too. So they even by your met, like in the U.S., I would say, you know, because we have so many wealthy people, they, hoarding they have wealth. we got the product of uh, capitalism and why we have homelessness. But, you know, in China, they have people who are allowed to get super wealthy and, you know, they've massively increased their home ownership rate largely via, you know, state investment. But they definitely have a lot of people in poverty still, too. So, I mean, you can point to that. But then you would just say, oh, By well, you know, metrics. They're, not, they're not any, their whole country poverty. has been relative. Or, I mean, their whole country has abolished relative poverty, which is a standard you know, by the, the World Bank and IMF, which are Western dominated financial institutions. It, it's relative absolute poverty based on a global rate. So it's not poverty. It's, it's absolute poverty on a global rate, which isn't meant to be measured country by country. It's meant to be measured globally. Okay, well, what what poverty metric would you like them to abolish? Um, well, usually, well, see, the thing with poverty is you can't always necessarily abolish it, per se, because of how it's measured, right? Like, a lot of times, countries will be like, oh, poverty is you're making 60% of, like, the mean income or something like that, right? So, like, technically, based on that, you could have people, like, rising up past a certain point. But they're st they're in their their lives are a lot better, but they're still in poverty. So you know that that could even be a point where, where even like the people in China say, "Oh, we still have a lot of people in poverty, but their 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 um welfare is much better off. You know, their their lives are much better off." And I they feel like that's what the World Bank and and IMF's um, global rating is is designed to do is you know sort of create this rate at which you know. If, if you reach above this rate, you can you can meet your needs relatively, you know, and, and you're you're living above poverty by by whatever standard that the IMF and World Bank determine. But I mean, maybe that's not good enough a standard, but it's still pretty incredible. I think that they've gone from a semi feudal country where famines were rampant um, to to that country. But I got to head out, though. I appreciate the discussion. I mean, we can talk another time. Um, I'll, do you have anything else you want to say before I head out? give you the final closing statement even um, yeah like for the most part well actually you know what uh, instead of that i want to go back because i actually had a question and i didn't get a chance to answer it okay, so yeah, i was sure. talking about the soviet union in like world war ii and you said the analysts said that they would have they, they were going to be worse off with the saras system but i'm, I'm t i don't know how that makes any sense like timeline wise because i'm talking about world war ii yeah world sorry i mean the analysts were saying that that in the lead up to world war ii so not under the czarist system i guess they were saying that the socialist system would get wiped out but because they were trying to build a socialist system out of this this czarist semi-feudal super impoverished economy. So the view of the Soviet Union at the time was as, you know, a third world impoverished country. Um, and there's no way that the socialists who just took over, you know, this working class Bolshevik party that just took over is going to be able to defeat the Nazis. Um, but because of the incredible industrialization and um, the country's collective war effort, they were able to survive, even though Western analysts said they were going to get wiped out. Okay. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of like, how the Tsarists would have fared in World War II. I don't think they would have gotten into World War II, to be honest with you. But if they did, I don't, I, I've never seen anything on that specifically. Now, I have seen, what was it? Let me see. It was, um, there's a book, Faulty Foundations, Soviet Economic Policies uh, by uh, two economists. And they did, they looked at it from the uh, new economic policy perspective. Mm. Or new, is, is that even what, the, the any, any, yeah, you know, NEP was when Lenin. And they implemented yeah. in the first year so they looked at it from that perspective and estimated that like th they would have been able to withstand invasion a lot better had they gone that route but yeah i don't think the czar or anyone else would have gotten into like the molotov rip and drop pact or anything like that and kind of gotten that involved with the nazis to where the nazis then like switch and are like oh yeah now we're invading you well i mean the molotov rip and drop pact was them trying to not get invaded that was them saying, let's let's try right, to right. East Street so we don't get invaded. But I mean, they, I don't know. What the, I don't know what couple. the czars would have done. I don't know. I don't. I mean, yeah, I have no idea. That's an interesting question, though. All right, I gotta head out. Interesting discussion, right. man. Thanks. Yeah, I'll see you around.
Yep. Peace.